Greetings to you, fellow time travellers, wherever and whenever you are. It's always lovely to know that you've joined me for another journey through one million years of English, Scottish, Welsh and Irish history. To make sure you don't miss the next or indeed any of the stops on this historical journey of ours, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. The button's down there, uh, or the details are below. History, comment, raising questions, what could be better? All good stuff for getting the grey cells going. And if you want to help support this channel in a practical way, you could sign up to my Patreon.com site. Costs a bit of cash, but you get exclusive access to my weekly question and answer session. Uh, there's competitions with prizes, and you'll find all the details below. Okay, now it's time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off for another stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. They wouldn't be walked over, even if it meant being sent away to a living hell in which they were supposed to die. In this episode, the spectre of poverty rises dark and menacing across Britain as machines become more powerful. Rebellion starts to spread. And brutal reprisals follow. In Dorset, a group of workers came together to dream of a better future. But for daring to stand up straight, demand dignity and call for a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, they were crushed by the authorities and transported to the penal colonies of Australia. A public outcry swept across the country as the people rose up to their defence. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil, in the last episode we followed you and Mary Anning, the fossil hunter extraordinaire, along the breathtakingly beautiful Jurassic Coast. Where are we this week? Paul, we're leaving behind the majestic storm-swept cliffs of the south coast to go and sit in the shade of a peaceful sycamore tree, which found itself at the centre of a different kind of storm that was sweeping across the whole of the British Isles. It was here that a group of workers caught the attention of the whole nation as they began their struggle for dignity and liberty. We're in the picturesque Dorset village of Tollpuddle. Hi Paul, we're in Tollpuddle, uh, in Dorset. Tollpuddle's such a good name, it sounds like, um, you know, it's like something from a, I don't know, a children's story or... <laughs> you'd expect maybe somebody like Mrs Tiggywinkle to live in a place like Tollpuddle. <laughs> yeah, so weird. But, uh, in, in fact, if anyone has heard of it, they will immediately, in their heads, they will automatically hear the word martyrs, the Tollpuddle martyrs, and the reason that it deserves a, a love letter is because of the iconic role that Tollpuddle and the Tollpuddle Martyrs has in what you would call the Labour movement. The Labour movement, at its very beginnings, when landowners and the owners of factories and the owners of coal mines and all the rest of it were absolutely exploiting the poor people, absolutely exploiting the workforce. So we're talking about the early part of the, the 19th century, the 1820s and 30s, and there was finally an uprising, if you like, in as much as enough of working people said, we can't go on like this, and we are in, and we should be entitled to something as simple as a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, so that we can look after ourselves, our families. It was the beginning of all of that, when workers had nothing. Workers over the years have, have gained a lot, but when Tollpuddle came into the spotlight, workers really had, had nothing at all. If you go to the village now, parts of it are looked after by the National Trust. 
specifically the village green and a sycamore tree that grows there. And it's generally regarded as the largest sycamore tree in the southwest of England. It grows on the green and it's been there a long time. And it was a place where some of the farm workers, the farm labourers, would gather in its shadow, in its shade, in its shelter, to discuss their unhappy lives and to make some plans for making things better. And there's something terribly current about Tollpuddle. The feelings, the anxieties of the people of Tollpuddle and, and all over Britain at that time, they're a kind of a, a warning of what's happening now. Because in the 1830s, let's say, in the, in the late 1820s and 18, 1830s, the agricultural revolution and the Industrial Revolution, but all of it was turning things upside down for people. People were being undermined by the advances that were being made in agricultural techniques and machinery and industrial techniques and machinery. People were losing out to machines because, you know, factory owners and landowners were realising that they could use machinery to replace people. And of course, for a lot of people right now, that's a clear and present danger. Things like artificial intelligence and the rise of, of technology is replacing people again. And a lot of ways of earning a living, even skilled occupations, are under threat from artificial intelligence and technological advances now that can that are really putting people under pressure. Well, it's happened before and it certainly happened in the in the early 19th century. What it was doing to people was crushing them underfoot, really. Wages were being driven down. The cost of living wasn't going down, so people were just getting poorer and poorer. And landowners and the bosses of, of factories were getting richer. And so, you know, the spectre of poverty was there for too many men and too many women. And some of the response was violent. There was a move in many places to smash machinery, to smash up factories and to smash up machinery on the farmland that was replacing people. And in southern and eastern England, uh, there were letters were turning up on the doorsteps of landowners signed by a character called Captain Swing. He was a fictional creation. There was no such person, uh, but it was threatening letters, and it, and it was just des it was desperation. But what developed there became known, uh, certainly by the authorities, as the Swing Rebellion. And so the the landowners and the and the government, everyone in authority, became very exercised about all these labourers and workers getting up on their hind legs and demanding things. They didn't like it, as they never do. Hundreds and hundreds of men were arrested and they were charged with all manner of, of offences and often they were threatened with hanging. Uh, you know, the death penalty obviously was, was still in play. But most of them were transported, which is to say they were put on ships and taken to Australia to be slave labourers. The fledgling colonies only became profitable because there was access to penal labour. And lots of people got swept up into that because it was in the interests of those in the colonies to have access to that free labour supply. So let's imagine that the judiciary was complicit in sentencing people for minor infringements of the law and throwing them aboard these, these hellish ships and having them transported to Australia where they were just worked to death. Wow. It's quite extraordinary that it, it, that it, it could happen not that long ago, really. That's right. You know, the, eight, the 18, we're talking about the 1830s here. It's only generations ago. It's not that far out of reach. My grandparents were born in the 1880s. Oh, wow. You know, I mean, it, you know, that's just my... So my great-grandparents, yeah. great-great-grandparents, there you are, you're right back in the 1830s. This is not cruelties and uh, indignities being foist upon people in the dim and distant past. It's only just out of reach. Now, I mean, to get back to... To Tall Puddle. The Tall Puddle Martyrs, so called, were two brothers, George and James Loveless, then James Hammett, James Brown, and a father and son, Thomas and John Stanfield. 
and they were labourers in and around Tollpuddle. And in 1833 in, in Tollpuddle, George Loveless, you know, one of the brothers, he, he emerged as the leader of what was known as a friendly society. And the friendly societies, you might as well think of them as the fledgling trades unions. Workers had realised instinctively that rather than trying to fight for their rights individually, one-on-one, -on -one, that if they clubbed together, they could bring their collective weight to bear in demanding better pay, better conditions, that kind of thing. I mean, that's that's the ethos of the, of the trades union. You know, united we stand. You know, it is that idea that one stick is easily snapped, but a bundle of sticks together is, is unbreakable. And so... In Tollpuddle, a friendly society was established. George Lovelace, who seems to have been an articulate, erudite individual, and he was a, a motivational, a charismatic figure, and he was simply dedicated to shaping and gaining a better life for the workers. So it was harmless enough. Lovelace was a Methodist, right? I mean, he's a, a lay preacher, a God-fearing man. And they met in a little Methodist chapel, just this handful of individuals, and the mistake they made, if you like, and it, as it turned out, it was, a, it was a desperate mistake. It wasn't illegal to form a union or indeed a friendly society. In fact, in the February of 1834, the Grand National Consolidated Trades Union was formed in London. There was no law against it, but as an act of faith, the Tollpuddle men, they swore an oath to one another which amounted to each man placed his hand on the Bible, swore an oath to stand together and to, and to look after one another. And this was all done while they, they would look at a painting of a skeleton. And the skeleton represented or was to remind them that their span was short, that one day soon they were going to end up in the ground. And, you know, they had to make the most of their time on earth. So it was a, it was a simple ritual. But although it wasn't illegal to form a trades union or a friendly society, there were laws banning the swearing of secret oaths. They'd been on the statute book for the longest time. And so when it came to it, when the authorities, you know, needed to bring down the hammer, they were able to prosecute these people, not for forming friendly societies, but for the swearing of oaths. So that was what they got them on. Before they were actually taken and arrested, they had been meeting in the chapel, then they could feel the heat coming. It was becoming more and more problematic. They knew that they were in trouble and that they were going to get arrested. And so rather than meet in a lit chapel where they were obvious, they took to gathering under the branches of the sycamore tree. And that's why the sycamore tree in the village green of Tollpuddle is looked after by the National Trust because it stands for something. the tall puddle martyrs asking for? It, it, it came to a head for the tall puddle men. Because of industrialisation and because of the advent of machinery, the value of people's physical labour was dropping because the landowners didn't need so many people to work on the land. And so the wages began to drop. Landowners were trying to cut wages back to as little as like six shillings a week. The tall puddle men led by George Lovelace, were refusing to work for less than 10 shillings a week. Right, so they, were, you know, they were almost asking for double what the landowners were. So that was an immovable object and, a, you know, and an unstoppable force. And the landowners were trying to break the people individually, but, but because of groups coming together as these friendly societies or these fledgling trade unions, it's harder to break groups of people than it is to break individuals. So push came to shove... And the landowners looked to the government to help them break the opposition. And although it wasn't illegal to form a union, they found loopholes. And the loophole that let them go after people like the tall puddle men was, this, was the swearing of unlawful oaths. Um, you know, so they were just using every trick in the book to try and break these men. Ten shillings a week. Even in the 1830s, that wasn't much, was it? No, it, it, well, it, it, it was all, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure they had calculated that that was, that was enough. You know, that was going to let them buy the food they needed and whatever. But the landowners were trying to offer them half. They basically pushed the toll puddle men into a position where they had nothing to lose. You know, if they'd accepted the six shillings a week, 
that had been destroyed anyway, so they had nothing to lose, and so they said, no, we draw a line here and we won't cross it. And that's what you've got to do. I mean, there are, there are people, any individual or any group of individuals, eventually you've got to decide that you're drawing a line and you hold the line. And that's what happened. Why were they seen as such a threat? Well, the landowners, the government didn't want... Governments don't like it when the people get up on their hind legs. They don't like it when people start demanding things like rights. <laughs> You know, people protesting, if, if, they're, if they're protesting about something that makes the government of the day uncomfortable, then that tends to get stamped on pretty damn quick. And that's what happened in, uh, in the England of the 1830s. The government could see that it was going to cause all manner of unrest. You know, their friends were the landowners, their friends were the, the factory owners, the industrial figureheads, and they were demanding that something be done. And it was their side. The government took their side and took their part. And so the Tollpuddle men knew that other unions had been broken up, that, that kind of activity, demanding of rights, had been suppressed elsewhere. So they knew, it was, they knew it was only a matter of time. And so, sure enough, sure enough, they were arrested and they were taken to, or they were tried at the what was called the Dorchester Assizes in March of 1834. And they were charged with the swearing of oaths, secret oaths. And it was a foregone conclusion. It was a kangaroo court, all six of the tall puddle men were found guilty of, as it was described, administering an unlawful oath and they were sentenced, each of them, to seven years' transportation. That would have been regarded as a death sentence. If you survived the journey to Australia, you'd be doing well enough. And then at the other end, they were just slaves. They were just slave labour. Worked to death in the conditions of fledgling Australia, out there in the heat and the various privations. So to be sentenced to seven years transportation, hypothetically you would be a free man after seven years, but you couldn't come home. You'd still be in Australia, you know, so there was no getting out of it. They'd be expecting to die. And so they arrived in Australia, they were, they were tried and convicted in the March, and by the summer of that year, 1834, they were in Australia. But, and here's, the, here's, what's, here's what's magnificent, what the authorities had not counted on was the public outcry. The conviction and the transportation of the tall puddle men, you might say it went viral. They became a cause celebre and there were marches in the streets, protesters came out, you know, demanding justice for the tall puddle six. There were petitions, hundreds of thousands of workers signed petitions. And because parliamentarians, they're so venal and they're so predictable. They simply realised that they had been caught out of step with the people. They thought they had judged the public mood and that the public wanted order. But in the case of the Tollpuddle Martyrs, they got it wrong. And the people, they knew it was wrong. It was an injustice that had been inflicted upon those men. And they became known as the Tollpuddle Martyrs. Their families, you know, their wives and children left behind, they were getting financial and practical support from members of other friendly societies and trades unions. They were funneling cash to those families to keep them afloat. And basically, by 1836, the government issued free pardons. So within two years of their convictions, the government had pardoned them. And astonishingly, I mean, they had been out there for two years at that point, and despite the brutality of the system, all six had survived and they were brought home. They were put aboard a ship and they all came back to, to Dorset in triumph. It's, it's remarkable. I think quite early on, actually, I think before he was even transported, I think while he was still imprisoned, George Lovelace had put pen to paper and, amongst other things, he had written, we raise the watchword liberty. We will, we will, we will be free. And that has become and has been a clarion call for workers and for the labour movement ever since. We will, we will, we will be free. And the actions of the Toll Puddle men are foundational. They were one of the very first instances of a group of downtrodden, the poorest of the poor, getting up on their hind legs, their voices being heard, their message spreading out into the wider population and justice had to be done. 
it became too much and the authorities couldn't ignore it, couldn't leave it. And they had to do the right thing whether they wanted to or not. So it was an, an extraordinary achievement. If you go to Tolpuddle now, the little Methodist chapel, which it may in fact have been built by George Loveless in the first place, and it's now a grade two listed building. It was sort of replaced in terms of a place of worship by a larger chapel that was built in 1862, that original chapel where the Tolpuddle men had met and worshipped and, and, and formed a friendly society. It was used as a barn, but now it's in the care of the Tolpuddle Old Chapel Trust, and it's a quiet place where people are invited to go in and sit and think. It's a little place of refuge, and, and then not far from the chapel you can find the sycamore tree. For a long time... People said, ah, there's no way that tree can have been anything to do with the Tollpuddle Martyrs, because it's not very big. And people said, it can't be old enough. It must be something that had grown up since. But in 2005, the Forestry Commission took a sample from it, and they were able to use a new scientific technique to demonstrate that it had probably grown from seed in the 1680s. So by the time the Tollpuddle men were gathering, it would have been about 150 years old. So because of its role, because of what it means to the history of the labour movement, the sycamore tree and the village green, as I said, they're now in, under the care of the National Trust. And it's one of those places, like the, the story that we told about Tilbury, where there's the Tudor jetty that Queen Elizabeth I stepped ashore to come and rally the 20,000 men waiting for a possible invasion by the Spanish Armada, 1588, and speculated that some of the atoms of the breaths that she exhaled while she was making that speech about having the, the weak and feeble body of a woman but the heart and stomach of a king, you know, that some of the atoms exhaled might be just there in the mix at Tilbury. Well, there's, there's a sense of that at Tollpuddle, that maybe down amongst the roots of the trees, there's something, there's something of those days when the Tollpuddle men gathered. Now, it's a thought that you take in your imagination, if you take it at all. But nonetheless, it's an atmospheric place and you stand there and you think that all that was really happening was hard-working men and women and they wanted dignity and they wanted to be treated with a modicum of respect and they wanted a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And then you think that sycamore tree is 300 and odd years old. Now, 300 years isn't old, not in the scheme of the species, which is 200,000 years old. And imagine that the right to a fair day's pay for a fair day's labour is younger than a 300-year-old tree. It's so recently that anyone has been treated with that kind of dignity. And they've only been treated with that kind of dignity on account of individuals like the Toll Puddle men who just wouldn't be backed down. They wouldn't be walked over, even if it meant being sent away to a living hell in which they were supposed to die. And it was because of their determination to stand up in the face of that kind of oppression that so relatively recently working people have been able to rely on any kind of security, any kind of respect. And it's back amongst us again because the rise of the machines that's going on at the moment and the new technology is going to put people out of work. And you're going to see the same anxieties again. People are going to be saying, I have lost my employment because of technology. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to feed my family? So we'll see it come again. There will be another necessity for the working populations of countries like Great Britain and elsewhere to say, what about us? We've got a right to be here. Our hopes and aspirations are as important as Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. What about us? It resonates all the way back to the Tollpuddle Martyrs. I always associate the beginning of the labour movement with dark satanic mills and industrial landscapes, but Tollpuddle is one of those classically picturesque Dorset yeah. villages, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely. It's a. It's still a village, you know. It's still a. It's still a small place, and the heart of it. The village green and the tree is as it was. Still, it's odd to think of the organised labour movement germinating in the rural landscape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I suppose it is, because it's also only relatively recently that people moved away from the land. For the longest time, the population lived on the land, and people who lived in towns, far less cities, 
were the minority. It was the advent of the Industrial Revolution and the building of the factories and the mills and the opening of the coal mines that caused people to come away from the land and to congregate in the urban environment. You know, so we were a rural population for most of the time. We've only recently had to adapt as a population to the kind of urban dwelling that we all do, you know, living amongst concrete and tall buildings that we take for granted. It's not normal. <laughs> you know, for, for most of the time, people lived other. People lived differently and they were connected to the land. You know, and so the fact that the first consequences of the change of something as momentous as the agricultural revolution were felt first of all in the countryside, you know, that's why. That's why the toll puddle martyrs come from a, a rural location. People had been able to make a living by their muscle, by their sweat. But the agricultural revolution and then the industrial revolution changed all of that and marginalised people. You know, because whatever, you know, a combine harvester is going to do the work of, you know, a hundred guys with scythes. They are literally redundant. That's a problem that's coming back now as technology at the moment replaces and makes redundant more and more people, you know, you have to honour those people. From highest to lowest, all people, they're entitled to have a means by which they can provide for themselves, provide for their families and children, keep roofs over their heads, put food on the table. And as technology takes that away from more and more people, we're going to have to have a conversation about how else it's to be achieved. Because people have a right to live and work. shadow falling across all of Ireland. And Gorta Moor, the great hunger, starvation stalking the land. Over a million people died as ships fully laden with food left the Irish ports. Greed and profit over lives. Maybe a million more fled the horror, emigrating to North America, Canada and elsewhere. Unimaginable pain and suffering that has caused a deep wound between these islands ever after. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. Social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.